Welcome to Gracefully Grading. I'm your host, Attorney Henry Gornbein. Please visit my YouTube channel to see all of the series of Gracefully Graying as we continue to grow and tell all your friends about it. Today on Gracefully Graying, I'm pleased to welcome my guest, author, publisher, really Renaissance man, R.J. King, as we talk about his new book, Detroit Engine of America. Welcome to Gracefully Graying. Great to be here. Thank you for having me, Henry. R.J., first of all, tell us about why you decided to write this book on Detroit, and starting really with its inception. Well, uh, as editor of uh, Deep Business Magazine and Deep Business Daily News, uh, and then we also have our Detroit Magazine, at the back of uh, both Deep Business and our Detroit, we have uh, historical pieces in Deep Business, it's called Closing Bell, and our Detroit, it's called The Way It Was. And we look back at in an industry or a person that once was that contributed uh, to the city's growth. And in those uh, research efforts, we kept looking at different books and periodicals, and there was never really a book that described how the city was built from a French fort on the riverfront in 1701 up to 1900, birthplace of the automotive industry. So I saw a gap in Detroit's history, a, a very large gap, uh, that not many people appreciated that Detroit's older than the country, uh, having been founded in 1701. Uh, it's the oldest city in the Midwest, and as the more I got into it, the more I found these amazing uh, advances, uh, new technologies, the, um, the use of steel, uh, largely for the first time, uh, in this country, uh, and really uh, a prodigious uh, manufacturing economy emerged, uh, basically because Detroit had to be self-sufficient because of its early founding by the French in 1701. It was, you know, 600 miles to get to the East Coast, and in those days there's no Erie Canal, so you really had a portage uh, to get here, so uh, you can only do that during the warmer months. Uh, so to get here was really a, quite a feat, and then to stay here, uh, you had to be very sustainable and really develop everything you need, and because of that, uh, that really contributed to the city's growth. RJ, let's start at the beginning. And you're saying 1701, French settlers, uh, one of whom was Cadillac, founded Detroit. Why there and how? Well, uh, it, to uh, the first chapter of the book is 1600 to 1800. And then every chapter after that is, you know, 1800 to 1900 by decade. Right. Uh, so the first chapter sets everything up. Uh, so it talks about the four superpowers of Europe at the time, which was England, France, Spain, and the Dutch, and how the English and the Dutch settled the East Coast. The Spanish went down to Florida and the West Indies and Cuba. And the French came up uh, the St. Lawrence and um, founded Quebec and then Montreal. And then uh, they came down and got Detroit in 1701 and then into Ohio and Kentucky. And that was all called New France, and that was a buffer to keep the English and the Dutch from expanding too far westward. Uh, so it really was some gamemanship. All four of those superpowers were looking to open up trade routes. Uh, the building of ships got a lot more specialized. And um, you know they wanted to begin to grow their economies, so by opening up these uh, new trade routes, they could do that, and, and what occurred was you start to see the first inklings of the creation of a middle class. And it began with a fort. And the fort was attacked, it burned down, and it was rebuilt. And let's talk a little bit about really the beginning of how it moved from a fort to the beginning of a city. Well, uh, when the Cadillac and the French, 100 men, arrived on July 24, 1701. They immediately started building a fort, uh, somewhat crude. Uh, they didn't have oxen or horse, so it was built by hand. And uh, over the years, they, they kept rebuilding it and growing it. Um, you had to be conscious of uh, potential Native American attacks, and they did get attacked from time to time. Um, so the fort was needed, and uh, as it grew, um, it was uh, outdated after a few decades, and in 1778, um, a new fort was built. Uh, by that time, the city was under British control uh, following the end of the Seven-Year War in uh, 1763. 
when Britain and, uh, was fighting against France, Spain, and the Dutch, and Britain won, so they got control of all of New France uh, for a period up until the Revolutionary War. Uh, so the British commander at the time, um, uh, Lenore, uh, called for the building of a new fort in 1778. And uh, that, is, uh, that fort was built where today we know where the U.S. courthouse is at Fort Street. And Shelby. So Fort Street is because of the fort. Yes, correct. And Shelby Street, and, and I can get into that in a little bit. Um, and so they, they essentially had two forts after that, one that hugged the river, the old one, and then one that was set a little bit back uh, from the riverfront, up more of a defensive position. The, the cannons had gotten more te technologically advanced so they could reach across the river. And uh, there was a moat that surrounded that uh, new fort. And then um, in uh, 1796, when the Americans finally got control of uh, the Michigan Territory, uh, they renamed it uh, Fort Detroit. And uh, it uh, was that way until the fire of 1805, uh, which occurred in early June of that year. And that first fort uh, was basically intentionally burnt to the ground by somebody, nobody knows who. Uh, but um, the, uh, the governor of the territory at the time, Governor Hall, had come here and, and found out that somebody had um, bought up all the lumber contracts for the rest of the year. And that was rather curious. So he canceled all those contracts, said that uh, you had to have permits to build uh, anything. Uh, so that began the permitting process here. And uh, in turn, the um, new streets would be uh, at least laid out on a map. They weren't built immediately by Judge Augustus Woodward, one of the three territorial judges that were appointed Hence by... the name Woodward Avenue after yep. him, and, mm -hmm. and all the streets are named after some of the original people. And let's right. tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I just wanted to finish Go the, ahead. the yes. fort story. So now yes. you have the one fort right. instead of the two, and, and then you start to see things develop into the first vestiges of a village and then a town and then you start to become a city. And just to finish the point, uh, at the end of the War of uh, 1812, as the Americans had the British and the Native American and Indians that had aligned with them under Chief Tecumseh on the run, there was a call out for more men. Uh, the governor of Kentucky uh, brought twice the number of men than requested. Uh, they did finish the job and, uh, and thanks on behalf of Detroit to uh, Governor Shelby of Kentucky. Uh, the street was renamed after him, so hence, uh, and the fort was named after him, so hence Fort Detroit became Fort Shelby. And that is at, or that was at Fort and Shelby, where the U.S. District Courthouse is. Then you have the layout of the city, and there's a chapter about that, and tell us about that. I mean, it's laid out after what, Paris. Yes, yeah, so um, like I mentioned, the second through the uh, 11th chapters just take you by decade. So okay. um, the, uh, when Judge Augustus Woodward arrived, he was one of the three territorial judges. Uh, coincidentally, they arrived the day after the city uh, first fort burned to the ground. Citizens were still in shock by that. They immediately, the three judges immediately took control. And Judge Woodward took it upon himself to design the new street grid system. Uh, he modeled it after Washington, D.C. and Paris, uh, but it is uniquely Detroit. And that's where Detroit got its nickname, Paris of the Midwest. And, so I didn't uh, know that. That's uh, interesting. So if you go to Paris or Washington, D.C. and have driven around or walked around, you'll see not so much a grid system, but you know, uh, central parks, um, you know, angled streets coming out, boulevards. Uh, so because Detroit you know, was built uh, off 180 degrees because of the river, um, you had circles like this and then streets radiating out like this. And it was really to make the street very walkable. Of course, when Judge Woodward designed his plan, nobody knew what the automobile was. Uh, but he had certainly been to D.C. He actually came from D.C. and he had been to Paris. So. Um, that's why downtown is, is, it is very walkable. Okay, then the next chapter you're dealing with, again, we're going through the 1800s and we're talking about 
the streets and you talk a little bit about how just the citizens of Sri and some of the prominent people. Right, so after the War of 1812, uh, Detroit really becomes modernized. It starts to grow rapidly. Uh, following the war, Lewis Cass was appointed governor of the territory. Uh, he immediately uh, encouraged business uh, to grow through permitting process. Uh, you had uh, Father Gabriel Richard arrive in 1798 and 1810. He brought the first printing press here. Um, you start to see things like the University of Michigan emerge in 1817, which originally was in downtown Detroit. Uh, it was a two-story, uh, white clappered, uh, sort of elongated house. And, um, and then, you know, the first president, sitting president arrived, President Monroe, uh, the following year. And then, you know, the, uh, formal government starts to emerge uh, for about 20 years following 1805 fire. The three judges kind of made themselves in charge. Uh, but in the early 1820s, you start to see a city council, uh, the f mayor, the first mayor of uh, modern Detroit, if you will, at that time was John R. Williams, hence the name John R. Street. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're appointing people to Congress uh, through citizen votes. There's a real uh, demand by citizens uh, to become a state as uh, the country was starting to grow. So, um, and then, you know, the first three industries that sustained the population back in 1701 were fishing, farming, and hunting, and hunting gets to the, the beaver trade that became its own currency at that time. And then um, in the 1750s, you start to see uh, ships of all different kinds being built, because in those days, everybody had to hug the river um, because there weren't the roads that we think of today. Uh, so to move passenger or freight or agricultural goods, uh, you had to be on the river. Uh, and then, you know, in the, into the 1820s, uh, we really start to get um, the ability to build steel, uh, the use of iron ore. Uh, so hearths, uh, which are stoves that are placed in the middle of the room with a chimney that went to the roof, would, would heat an entire room. And many of the houses had the, the fireplace in the center of the room. Uh, on each floor and with two sides so that the heat would distribute evenly. And then uh, we started really to get into uh, stove building and many of the other things. So Detroit became a center, I mean really manufacturing, stoves became a big thing. And I remember there used to be this huge stove, I don't know if it still exists, it used to be at the state fairgrounds. Yeah, that was originally um, at uh, where we know as the Uniroyal site. Right. at uh, Jefferson and uh, East Grand Boulevard where you have the entrance to uh, Belle Isle uh, over the MacArthur Bridge. And uh, that stove uh, eventually uh, went to the state fairgrounds. Unfortunately, it was struck by lightning and uh, was destroyed. It was mostly made of wood and then clad with iron um, because it was so large, it would have been very hard to, to craft that out of iron, but the stove industry uh, really uh, came into its own after the Erie Canal opened in 1825. So now you have the ability, uh, uh, you know, some limited days of because of weather if the Erie Canal gotten frozen, but now people can have a pretty easy way of getting from the East Coast. Uh, they take the Erie Canal and that gets them to the eastern edge of Lake Ontario and then they get on a ship and they come from Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and come to Detroit. And it was really Detroit, oldest city in the Midwest. It's even older than Pittsburgh. Uh, of course, it's older than Chicago and Indianapolis and Cleveland and Cincinnati. And this was the place to come. This was very much on the East Coast and in, throughout Europe. Detroit was this celebrated frontier town. It was like this, um, you know, Emerald City almost, because people were just amazed that how could they survive for so long in the interior when it was so hard to get here. So now, uh, at the time the Erie Canal opened in 1825, uh, upstate New York was the stove capital of the world. But people figured out very quickly that why do I need to build, bring, 
a large stove on a, you know, on a, 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 a raft um, and uh, get it on a ship and then get it to Detroit when I can buy a stove in Detroit. So we became the stove capital of the world for anybody that was either coming to Detroit or coming to Detroit to get supplies to keep going further west. We were also doing shipbuilding. So there was more and more manufacturing being done in Detroit, and Detroit continued to grow. Let's go to the, I don't know if we're skipping, but the Civil War became a prominent issue with regard to Detroit. Yeah, because we uh, were an industrial powerhouse, um, and I, uh, you know, nobody was doing statistics back then, but I would argue that at that time Detroit was likely the, the largest manufacturing economy in the world, uh, even more so than New York. And, um, you know, we, uh, in the 1830s, 1840s, we started building locomotives and rail cars. Again, because we had, um, you know, steel mills and foundries and brasseries, uh, all hugging the river still in those days. Um, and then we had the access to the natural resources. Uh, so iron ore and magnesium and copper. And uh, so when the call went out for uh, the Civil War um, as part of the Union, uh, we supported the Union Army and we supplied all manner of wagons and guns and munitions. Uh, the ladies um, of the town built or, you know, sewed the uniforms that all went to the front. And uh, it really accelerated our economy. Uh, should also mention in the 1840s, our third fort was built. Um, we had the original fort that burned down in 1805. The second fort, which uh, became Fort Shelby, uh, at Fort and Shelby, that was torn down in 1828. Uh, no longer needed, it was getting old. And then um, at that 1830s, 1840s, there was some concern about how British was handling Canada and Americans sympathized with Canadians that were um, pretty close to being up in arms uh, over taxation issues and things like that. And uh, we were concerned uh, there was a good fort in Amherstburg, uh, which is south of Windsor. So Fort Wayne was built, uh, it's still there today. So that's the only one of the three that remains to this day? Yes. No shots were, have ever been fired uh, at that fort, but it has always been used as uh, an, uh, uh, that's where you reported uh, if you either got drafted or volunteered uh, to be in the Army. And that fort served that purpose up until uh, the Vietnam War. Um, so during the Civil War, um, two things I mentioned. One was all the, the supplies uh, from the munitions and uniforms and all things that, uh, and food too. Um, and then um, we also were uh, supplying thousands of men, and uh, Michigan was one of the first, mostly Detroit, uh, were uh, the first to arrive uh, after President Lincoln's call uh, to form the Union Army. And uh, when those men arrived, uh, his three words were, thank God for Michigan. So uh, it, uh, and then after the Civil War, we were able to, uh, normally after war, your economy sees the fall off of demand for uh, the war munitions because they're no longer needed. But we were immediately able to convert those factories into consumer goods, agricultural goods, you know, wagons and uh, ships and all those types of things. So and Detroit continued to grow. A couple mm -hmm. things to digress. Uh, talk about Custer and Custer became famous during the Civil War because he was one of the heroes. And he's from, uh, originally from uh, Monroe, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you talked about Grant, who lived in Detroit. Yeah, um, Ulysses S. Grant lived in Detroit. He was stationed at Fort Wayne from 1849 to 1851. Uh, he came here with his wife and small girl. Uh, they lived in a home just outside of Fort Wayne uh, because the officers' uh, quarters weren't ready yet. And uh, he was the toast of the town, he and his wife. They went to all the um, important parties throughout the year. Um, he was pulled aside early on by a minister and told not to drink, which he followed. 
and uh, he had the fastest horse, uh, horse racing and um, ice fishing and uh, skating uh, were very popular uh, because you didn't have many books and of course there's no internet or TV or radio or newspapers, very little newspapers. Uh, so you had a, a lot of uh, you know, personal entertainment, I suppose is the best way to call it. And uh, so he loved Detroit um, in 1851. Uh, I should mention that the house that they lived in uh, was um, uh, preserved and it uh, eventually found its way to the Michigan State Fairgrounds where it is today. And now there's a plan to move that house uh, to Eastern Market where it will be uh, set on a new foundation and become a, a very active museum for school children uh, and adults. Uh, but after Grant was um, recommissioned to go to Maine in 1851, he stayed there for a time, and then uh, was re uh, uh, stationed again to uh, Oregon. And that's really when he started drinking. Um, he got caught drinking on the job. Uh, the Army said, you know, either you're going to get court-martialed or you're going to have to resign your commission. So he resigned his commission. and. Uh, and then when the war broke out, Civil War broke out in 1861, he convinced the governor of Illinois to give him uh, charge of a brigade, and he uh, just fought and fought and fought. Uh, some of the other generals under Lincoln were biding their time uh, to run against Lincoln in the 1864. Well, McClellan was one of the yeah, worst. Exactly. He, he refused yeah. to fight, and mm -hmm. just yeah. he was the leader of the army of the Mid Potomac and did nothing, basically. And as the book describes, uh, after the war, uh, Grant at that time was the uh, you know, general of the U.S. Army. He came back to Detroit for a five-day celebration, uh, which I would have liked to have seen uh, and been there. And uh, throughout his presidency and later in his life, even if he was in a sour mood, if somebody mentioned Detroit or introduced themselves as being from Detroit or Michigan, it was said that his entire mood changed and he would just embrace that person and want to talk about Detroit and how it was going. So again, it gets back to that celebrated uh, frontier town. So this was one of the highlights mm -hmm. and fond memories. Clearly. Yes. Another thing you mentioned in the book is uh, issues involving slavery and uh, race riots. Yeah, the first race riots, uh, which were largely generated by the newspapers, uh, as the book mentions, the Detroit Free Press took ads from uh, slave owners and bounty hunters uh, looking for slaves that had escaped from the South. Uh, Detroit was a major portal for the Underground Railroad. Um, Seymour Finney was one of the, the more famous of uh, people that supported um, the slaves and helped them get into Windsor. Uh, several others would hide them in their stores um, and, and get them to Canada. And the um, race riots, uh, the first one in 1832-1833 time frame, uh, was really uh, stoked by the Detroit Free Press and some of the other newspapers uh, because they were essentially supporting their advertisers. And um, so the militia had to be called in to quell those riots. and. Uh, People were injured. I don't think anybody ever got killed. Um, and uh, from time to time, you know, as Detroit was uh, drawing not only African Americans, um, uh, slaves that were looking uh, to be free, but you also had um, waves of immigrants coming as well. The Irish that were attracted to the Catholic faith here, um, the Germans, uh, they were going through a lot of wars over there. and. Um, the book also points out um, that Detroit was very smart. They created uh, language-specific leaflets that they would distribute all throughout Europe in a call out for professional trades. So the doctors and the dentists and the engineers, journalists, um, to come to Detroit where it was an established city, where you could be free to worship and live as you wanted to. Um, that did create tensions. Um, but overall, everybody got along pretty well. Well, we clearly encouraged immigration back then. What about architecture? And you write about you write about the the libraries, mm 
with various regional branches, and then the culmination being the down the Detroit Public Library on Woodward, which is right across the street from the DIA, Detroit Institute of Arts. But tell us a little bit more about how architecture impacts in your book. Well, architecture from uh, the early days, everything was built from wood. Uh, so in the beginning, you had log homes that were actually vertical logs. Then they went to the horizontal, uh, seeing that that was more efficient in terms of heating and, and the building of those uh, uh, structures, and then uh, as the sawmills emerged on the riverfronts, not only the Detroit River, the Rouge River, the Clinton River, and some of the other uh, tributaries, uh, you started to see more specialized wood develop. So you start to see the the clapboard houses. Uh, the first brick structure was uh, produced in the 1808, um, and that was the then Governor Hall, Hall's. Uh, residents and uh, stone started to get uh, into uh, use as a construction material and as we got more sophisticated we were able to create our own bricks and uh, that became an industry of its own and uh, but that you know that was really the middle of the 1800s um, there was the great fire of 1805 I mentioned but there were several other fires uh, in the ensuing decades and would just cause, you know, shock and fear among the residents because uh, obviously they didn't want their uh, homes or businesses um, burned and uh, these things could get out of hand very quickly uh, because you don't have fire hoses that can douse the roofs of these buildings. You literally had citizens pail to pail uh, in the early days from the riverfront to wherever the fire was, citizens passing the bucket to the next, uh, and eventually we got better fire fighting equipment. And then into the 1850s we got into the brick and the stone, and you start to see um, the um, influx of architects. And I'm going to interrupt you. We're yeah. down to less than a minute. I'd like sure. to get a couple of final thoughts before we wrap this segment with the understanding that you and I are continuing a dialogue in a second show. Okay. So what are a couple thoughts in the last 30 seconds before we wrap up? Uh, well, the book itself we designed like a journal, so it has the rounded edges, and also has a red silk page mark ribbon. Uh, we used a parchment paper effect. All the artwork is no, from No, it's, it's very the beautifully laid out. It has pictures. Oh. It has, uh, it goes, as, as you said, decade by decade, and has the highlights of each decade is how it relates to Detroit. So it's something well worth reading and before we leave the studio, I'm going to want your autograph on it. And, uh, but we're going to continue this discussion. RJ, I want to thank you so much for being my guest on Gracefully Graying. And I want to thank you for watching Gracefully Graying.